Well, it's lovely to be here and to be invited to do this, and uh, thank you all for coming on such a nasty wet night. I think I would have stayed at home and watched television instead. <laughs> um, it is a, a remarkable honor, actually, to, to replace Tony Atkinson, whose work I have known and admired all through my career. Um, I think he was uh, starting to work on inequality while I was a st still a student. Um, However, we've looked at very different aspects. Um, he has been concerned so much with measurement uh, and the quality of the data, um, whereas I've been looking at the effects. Um, that's partly because I'm an epidemiologist. I started off working on the huge health differences between rich and poor areas. Uh, in many societies, if you look at the richest and poorest areas uh, in the same city, you will find five-year differences in life expectancy uh, in some countries as much as 10, 15-year differences in life expectancy between richest and poorest areas. Um, and that's, uh, I think, one of the most astonishing human rights abuses in the developed world. Um, and really, the work I'm going to describe comes out of work around the world trying to understand what drives these health inequalities. Um, people often think about poverty as uh, simply a material deprivation and what going with less good housing and so on does to you. Um, I want to give you a slightly different picture. I left the piece of paper that I had this quote on um, at home, but fortunately I've uh, been able to get it on my phone. Um, so I'm going to read you a little bit from a study in just a couple of paragraphs of poverty in, I think, five different countries. Uh, Uganda, India, China, Pakistan, Korea, United Kingdom and Norway. Actually, that's more than five. I think that may, might be seven. So there's some poor countries in there where poor people in those countries are living in little corrugated iron shanty houses with no water supply, no sewerage. And there are also countries like Norway where the poor are living in three-bedroomed houses with central heating and flat-screen televisions. Why I want you to, to read this little bit to you is because they were, the researchers were interested in the experience of poverty in these different societies. And so they interviewed people at such different material standards. And this is what they said. Respondents universally despised poverty and frequently despised themselves for being poor. Parents were often despised by their children. Women despised their menfolk, and some men were reported to take, it, take out their self-loathing on their partners and their children. Despite respondents generally believing that they had done their best against all odds, they mostly considered that they had both failed themselves uh, by being poor uh, and that others saw them as failures. This internalization of shame was further externally reinforced in the family, the workplace, and in their dealings with officialdom. Even children could not escape this shaming, for with the possible exception of Pakistan, school was an engine of social grading, a place of humiliation for those without the possessions that guaranteed social acceptance. No parent was able to escape the shame of failing to provide for their children, even when children were prepared to stop asking for things, this latter itself being a further source of shame. For men, relying on others or on welfare benefits was perceived as a challenge to their sense of masculinity. A British father to two children admitted, he felt like shit. I'm the man in this relationship. I'm meant to be the man to take care of the missus and my kids, and I don't. So often when I talk about inequality, um, people say, but it's poverty that matters. It's not inequality. Uh, what I've just read you is about feeling socially inferior. 
I often say the naive view of inequality is that it only matters if it causes poverty or is regarded as very unfair. But actually the important effects of inequality are to do with superiority and inferiority. Um, and the very deep effects those have on people's idea of themselves on, and on social relationships. Since we started our work, uh, um, inequality has moved up the agenda very dramatically. Um, uh, so I, I just provide that slide to show how world leaders have been uh, talking about it. When we started, no one was talking about it. Um, <clears throat> This is normally my first slide because it shows how miserable we all are. Uh, I think more miserable in Britain than here, and I think part of that is an effect of inequality. <laughs> These are people outside Oxford Street, Street, Oxford Street tube station in the center of London. They're in the prime of life, they're going to work, um, and every single face there is haggard and gloomy and depressed and anxious. Um, you know, that woman looks as if she's having a nervous breakdown. And I do think that our work has something to say about the contrast between the material success of our societies and the many social failings. What I have, I'm going to summarize uh, the material in our book initially and then go on to some uh, newer things and actually as, as we've been talking about our book, we've, we've, our, our perspective on the material has improved. You know, you see statistical relationships, uh, but then, you know, what meaning you give to them, how you interpret them, and how they uh, relate to people's experiences is what matters. Um, but basically, I'm going to show you this graph again and again. Um, Income inequality along the bottom and problems up the side, whether it's health or violence or anything else. And basically, the more inequality, the worse these problems get. I'm going to show that, that for one, re one problem after another and then explain uh, why, what's going on. Um, a quick indication of what social status differentiation does to us can, it comes from these... Uh, experiments called stereotype threat experiments. This one uh, comes from a World Bank report um, where Indian children from different castes, high castes and low castes, were given little pen and paper tests to do. They did them in two conditions. One when they didn't know each other's caste and then when they knew who was high and who was low caste. And when they don't know each other's caste, there's no difference. When they do know each other's caste, the low caste kids do much less well. And actually, uh, maybe this isn't, oh, I haven't turned it on, that's why it's not working. Can't blame anyone. Um, and these same uh, experiments have been done uh, on social class, on ethnicity, uh, on gender. So apparently if women do a, some sort of test and have to tick a box at the beginning to say whether they're a man or a woman, they do worse than if they tick the box at the end of the test. We are so sensitive to any uh, imputation idea that we are socially inferior. Um, that it actually affects performance. Um, I want to actually get into the data with something a long way from this. These are rich developed countries, uh, life expectancy and national income per head. And you see that there's no difference at all whether a country has twice the national income or only half that. Uh, it makes no difference to life expectancy. Of course, if we had developing countries on there, much poorer countries, you'd see a great curve coming down here. All the poorer countries, uh, like Bangladesh with low life expectancy, would be down here, uh, then the middle-income countries, and the rich countries on a flat part of that curve, where the relationship between national income per person and life expectancy is entirely lost. And that's important because it's... Uh, 
It goes with many other indications of welfare no longer being um, improved by economic growth. If you look at measures of well-being or happiness, satisfaction, um, they look just the same. Uh, economic growth is what's transformed the real quality of our lives, and yet it's largely finished its work in the rich developed countries. Poorer countries need higher living, material living standards, um, but it doesn't help us. Most of it is about status competition, as I'll show you later, and consumerism. But although you see no relationship here, if you look within our countries, as I was saying earlier, the differences between the poor areas and the rich areas within any of our cities, you find these extraordinary gradients in health. I keep on showing this one in, in my talks because uh, it's such a clear gradient. Um, you know, these, each of these is 5% of the um, population and uh, uh, you see the poorest small areas here, the poorest neighborhoods with the shortest life expectancy and the richest with the long life expectancy. Note, this is not a difference between the poor and everyone else. It's a gradient right across society. So we're all part of this picture of health inequalities. Michael Marmot, who is, I suppose, the, the f one of the foremost researchers in the world on these health inequalities, says you can take away all the problem of poverty and poor health and you've still got most of this picture left. You know, the unemployed, the homeless make a contribution here. They don't explain that bit at all. But you see, there's such an extraordinary contrast between this and that. Income doesn't matter between our rich developed countries, but it's terribly important within them. The explanation, I think, is of that paradox is that within our societies, we're looking at the effects of social position, relative income, social status, where we are in relation to each other, and link that with what I've just shown you about those stereotype threat experiments, your superiority or inferiority and in how it affects performance. As soon as you've got the idea that this paradox is explained in terms of where we are in relation to each other, we need to think what happens if you make the differences between us bigger or smaller. And that's really what our, our book was about. And we use this data that comes from the um, UN Human Development Report, but it's the same data as the World Bank had uh, when we collected it. Um, and it's, we just use this measure because they provided it and it's very easy to understand. How much richer are the top 20% than the bottom 20% in each country? In these countries, Japan, Finland, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Belgium, they're three and a half to four, four and a half times as rich, the top 20% compared to the bottom. But in the UK, Portugal, USA, Singapore, the gap is twice as big. And that allows us to start looking at this. I should say, because critics suggest that we've been picking and choosing data, which, you know, a, an academic epidemiologist cannot do things like that. It would be, well, I, I suspect one might get dismissed if one did it, but anyway. Uh, we have an absolute rule that if our data source has data for one of the countries we're looking at, it goes into the analysis. We make no judgments about the quality of the data. If WHO have, says that's the life expectancy, it goes in. If OECD says that is kids' maths and literacy score on their tests, it goes in to the analysis. So no picking and choosing, but basically, I mean, just a quick summary of, of uh, that work. We got all these uh, um, variables out for different countries, uh, the kind of problems with, with social gradients, uh, the more common at the bottom of the ladder. Uh, and we put them all into one index, an index of health and social problems. They're all weighted equally. Um, so when we related it to that measure of income inequality I've just shown you in the rainbow stripes, um, there is an astonishing relationship. So all these uh, a country's position is it's just its average score on those things. Um, in fact, you use uh, what are called Z-scores in statistics, statistics to make sure that um, they are all weighted equally. 
And you see here that the more unequal countries, USA, Portugal, UK, do much worse on all those things than the ones uh, here. It look, looks like something out of physics with me some measurement error. If you look at the same index, the same numbers for each country in relation to national income per head, there's no relationship at all. At all. And for people who say we pick and choose which problems we look at, we also looked at the UNICEF index of child well-being. It has 40 different components, you know, whether there's bullying at school, um, whether parents have books at home, whether kids get immunized. Um, everything goes into that index, um, and we have nothing to do with its uh, um, composition. Um, here you see that how well kids do in different countries is unrelated to gross national income. So some countries being twice as rich as others does not help children at all. But if you put it, that same figures on child well-being against income inequality, the more unequal societies, children do much less, much less well. This is the 2013 report in our book. We showed the earlier figures 10 years earlier. Um, there is a statistical uh, significant relationship between changes in inequality over those 10 years and changes in, in, in child well-being. Um, okay, I want to just give you a quick idea of some of the rest of the data. I can't go through it all uh, before going on to explain what's happening behind the data. Uh, this is a measure of trust from the World Values Survey. Um, people are asked whether they agree that most people can be trusted. So it's really asking you not about whether you can trust your friends, but whether you can trust other people you don't know. Um, and you see in uh, the more unequal countries down there, it's, what, 15 or 20 percent feel they can trust others, but up there it's 60 or 65 percent. We repeated all this, uh, uh, this uh, work looking at the American states uh, as a sort of separate test bed. Um, our critics have taken our work often as if um, we invented this story. The first papers in peer-reviewed academic journals showing that uh, health tended to be worse in more unequal societies came out in the 1970s. The same is true of the first papers showing that violence was more common in more unequal societies. There are now over 300 papers in peer-reviewed journals looking at this in different parts of the world. So what we were doing was not providing new evidence so much as providing a, 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 the most accessible possible picture of what had been coming together in the academic journals. And because these things are not related to GNP per capita, we didn't have to control for GNP per capita. Um, we knew other people had controlled for education and poverty and so on. Uh, there are very sophisticated statistical um, uh, methods used in the, the various papers in the journals, uh, looking at changes over time and so on. Um, so. Our, what, what we did was simply to try and make the picture accessible to the wider public. I may say, though, that when <laughs> this measure of trust, it goes with the decline of community relationships. Um, community life is weaker. If you look at books like um, Robert Putnam's Bowling Alone or his earlier study of democracy in, in the, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, Making Democracy Work in the regions of Italy, he shows uh, that there are strong relations with inequality between strength of community life and uh, inequality. There are now a lot of papers uh, looking at that. Um, and trust is one of the more accessible variables that uh, again and again people show that it is strongly related to inequality. If you've got to walk home in any big city, you'll feel much safer walking home at night on your own if you're in one of the more equal societies. Um, but there's a continuum. Initially you get that decline in trust, 
Uh, there's now also a paper showing people are less willing to help each other in more unequal European societies. They're less willing to help the elderly or disabled. Um, but you also get these increases in violence. So these are American states, Canadian provinces here. Uh, this isn't our work. This is people at McMaster University in Canada. Um, but look, 15 homicides per million population here, and it's, there's 150 up there. Tenfold differences. It's a more striking relationship than ours in our book. And it's not, I, I, I know that 11-11-11 uh, uh, is not just interested in the developed world. Uh, in developing countries, you get the same relationships. This uh, uh, analysis um, is, um, I think, again, by people at the World Bank, uh, covers sub-Saharan Africa, um, parts of Asia and Eastern Europe and Latin America, and you get just the same thing. Um, it doesn't look such a steep relationship because uh, it's on a log scale here, um, but still highly significant. But look, you move from being less helpful to others, less trusting of others, and more violence, to actually moving to a point where this is um, Mexico, where I, I was giving a few lectures, where people all around their houses, there are bars, there's razor wire on top, Exactly the same thing in South Africa. Um, I'm sorry, this isn't a clearer picture. Those are electric wires on top. And a lot of the houses um, seem to have those kinds of defenses, often a large dog there as well. This notice, if you could read it, it says, armed response. Um, and so you move from a society where people feel some sort of cooperation, reciprocity, willingness to help each other, a sense that, you know, you can trust most people, to a situation eventually where you actually feel threatened by other people. And each of those stages you can see is, is related to in, increasing levels of inequality. Um, Bowles and Jayadev um, produced this graph in an article in the New York Times. Um, what it shows is with increasing inequality, uh, the proportion of the labor force in each society uh, made up of what they call guard labor. By that they mean police, prison officers, security staff, people like that. That increases with inequality. I would like to see the number of solicitors because I think people probably uh, go to law more often. They can't settle disputes amicably and so you start spending your money on lawyers to deal with each other. Um, I haven't uh, found comparable data on that. But, um, you know, it's all very much of a, the same picture. Uh, imprisonment also rises. Uh, again, tenfold differences. This is a log scale. 40 would be higher than you expect as it's a log scale. Uh, so about there, going up to 400 prisoners per 100,000 population, mainly due to more punitive sentencing. Um, social mobility is lower. I think we produced the first graph showing that social mobility was lower in more unequal countries. There are now several more analyses including data for other countries. Um, <clears throat> and you see, again, it's not something just about the rich developed countries. Uh, it's true in, in uh, middle-income countries too. Um, <clears throat> in fact, the difference between the rich developed countries and others, uh, poorer countries, is that uh, in poorer countries, economic growth still matters. It still makes an important difference. These, this is infant mortality. And along here you've got GNP per capita. Um, the top line are, is for the most unequal societies. The bottom line is the most equal societies. And you see that infant mortality is lower at all stages in economic development. Um, but clearly, uh, GNP per capita has a very important effect early on, but out here, uh, it's really just inequality that's left. Um, 
Yeah, we now know quite a bit about time lags. I was worried for a very long time because there isn't much relationship between current inequality and death rates of people my age and older. Um, and I didn't know whether that was somehow that in old age one's immune to inequality um, or what it could be. And it turns out that there are lifelong influences of inequality. We knew that your social status at different points in your life affected uh, health in later life. We now know that the, the inequality you've lived through affects uh, your health later on. Uh, yeah, I'm going to skip this. It's just to show that um, uh, the, there are pretty sophisticated statistical methods. Um, this is a multi-level analysis of, uh, uh, sorry, a meta-analysis of multi-level models using cohort studies over time, so on. I've been pointing out how big the differences are in performance of richer and poorer countries, sorry, more and less equal countries, uh, because that tells you in itself that it isn't just the poor being affected by inequality. As I showed you in those blue columns all the way across uh, the health differences, uh, that the health inequalities are not just something to do with poverty, but it, we're all part of it. So uh, the effects of um, inequality uh, the biggest at the bottom of society, but we are all affected by inequality. So um, these are, uh, it's, it's old data because um, it comes from when people were wondering whether health inequalities were the same in each country or different. And so some Swedish researchers classified their infant deaths on the British uh, occupational class classification. It's anachronistically by father's occupation, so single mothers have to go in their own category. Um, and then this categorization is unskilled manual workers, semi-skilled manual workers, skilled manual workers, uh, clerical workers, that's junior non-manual, uh, intermediate people like teachers and nurses, and then up here um, the um, professional occupations. And you see Swedish infant mortality rates, more equal Sweden, lower all the way across. The difference is the biggest here, but even there, there seems to be some advantage in being a more equal country. In our book, we have, I don't know, four or five bits of data like that, but now we have, there are many more papers remarking on the same basic pattern. Uh, colleagues at the Harvard School of Public Health using multi-level models uh, were struck by how far up the income scale uh, people were affected by inequality and they called inequality a general social pollutant because it, of the way it damages social relations and the social fabric of society. So, I mean, just to finish this summary, we looked at all these things. Um, and I, what puzzles people most, I think, is that so many quite different problems are all related to income inequality. In fact, the reason why is because they are all problems, as I said, with social gradients. By which I mean that although there's ill health and drug abuse and violence at the top of society, they're all more common lower down. And so, in a way, all we're saying is problems which we know are sensitive to social status get worse when you increase the social status differences. Um, and I, I know people look at these social gradients and they think, well, it, it's just the po population gets sorted out by social mobility. You know, the hopeless ones move down and the capable ones move up, the resilient move up. But if I was to divide this audience and say I want all the fair-haired ones to be socially mobile that way and the dark-haired ones that way, it wouldn't change the proportion of hair color in the room. And I've shown that these problems are anything from twice as common to ten times as common in more unequal societies, which I think means that these problems with social gradients are responses, very substantially, responses to social status differentiation itself. It's something about 
how social status differences get into us. I think it's not something that's quite different from the sort of social class pyramid or hierarchy. Um, am I most of the time stopping you seeing the, these graphs, or if I keep moving, do you manage to see them? Um, let's have some nods or shakes. <laughs> you can see them. Okay. So, you know, we've always known about these social gradients. Every teacher knows that uh, educational performance tends to be least good in the poorest areas and health is worse and so on. Um, so, really, this income inequality is telling us more about those relationships. Um, yeah, I'm going to skip that, but... One of the interesting things that's happened in the last few years, what date is this paper, 2012, is that psychologists have started talking about what they call the dominance behavioral system. If you like a module in the brain, uh, many animals have the same sort of setup, uh, which specializes in dealing with issues to do with social status differentiation. And in this paper, Sherry Johnson uh, she's an American psychologist, went through uh, an enormous volume of uh, psychological research and uh, showed, in, by using uh, papers with observational, experimental, and biological methods, uh, she, she needed evidence from each of those kinds of sources, that some mental illnesses are related and personality disorders uh, to being to feeling inferior or to struggling against inferiority and others to do with uh, uh, superiority or struggling against that when I saw her paper I got in touch with her and said and she was thinking of the social hierarchy as basically fixed in each society you know it's just there uh, every society has a, a class hierarchy uh, and, of course, I'm interested in how that hierarchy gets stronger or weaker as uh, affected by material differences. And I knew that there was some research showing that more unequal societies, some of these conditions become more common. And uh, now there are several papers, several more papers out there showing that. Um, I, to understand this, you have to really understand monkey dominance hierarchies and our evolved psychology. That's more important, I think, than understanding Marx, if you're just trying to understand the things I'm talking about here. If you look at a, a, an animal hierarchy, it's a bullying hierarchy. You know, the, the strongest monkey is at the top and the weakest is at the bottom and if there's some uh, dispute about status there's some trial of strength uh, to sort it out who is above who um, we don't have internationally comparable data on bullying amongst adults but we do amongst children we use one lot of data in our book but this is somebody else's paper with done since then with more countries and uh, you can see the huge differences in bullying this is children who bullied others two or more times each month. And down here, that's about 2% of children in the more equal countries. Uh, but in the more unequal ones, it rises to 20%. Again, a tenfold increase in uh, differences in, in bullying. Um, quite, quite remarkable, really. Um, I think when, again and again one sees in, in the epidemiology the contrast between relationships that are about dominance, uh, social status, superiority, inferiority, uh, how damaging that is to health, social inferiority, um, low social status, and friendship, which is highly protective of health. There was a meta-analysis, that is a paper which combines the results from lots of other studies. It combined the results from 150 studies of friendship and health. And it found whether or not you have friends is more important, or at least as important, as whether or not you smoke to uh, your survival in a follow-up period. So it's not a vague kind of uh, influence on health. It's a really major, strong influence. But there's that contrast between issues to do with dominance and subordination and issues to do with friendship. 
And those are just the two different ways human beings can come together. And if you look at some political philosophers, uh, you know, if you think of Thomas Hobbes, um, you know, he said life without a government to keep the peace would be nasty, brutish, and short. Uh, because he thought we all have the same needs and so we'd fight each other for everything unless there was a, a sovereign power able to keep the peace between us. I think he didn't realize the anthropological evidence wasn't there in the 17th century when he was writing, uh, but we now know that societies before government, hunting and gathering societies, actually were highly egalitarian uh, and based themselves on food uh, sharing and gift exchange. People made those enormous investments in each other in order to keep the peace. Um, but you see, these, these two relationships are basically the opposite of each other. And we know that we all have this potential all the time. I mean, uh, think of picking up somebody who's uh, hitching a lift. Uh, or, or you're hitching a lift. Now, if someone stops to give you a lift, are you vulnerable? Are you might to be attacked by this person? Um, or uh, are they, is it a kindness and a generosity? We can be the best or the worst for each other. And basically, our psychology has become highly attuned to these differences. So violence is more common in more unequal societies uh, because violence is triggered by disrespect, humiliation, loss of face. It's about our sensitivity to social status. Um, and you see it even in words like companion, um, that uh, it's a basically con and pan. Uh, it's about uh, sharing food and necessities. Um, and this remarkable American psych anthropologist who studied all his career hunting and gathering societies, you know, that egalitarian form of society which covers more than 90% of our existence as human beings. Uh, he makes this very nice statement, gifts make friends and friends make gifts. You know, the gift is the symbol of friendship because it's the most concrete expression that I'm not going to fight you for access to whatever it is. I recognize your need. I'm willing to share. And psychologists suggest that that sense of indebtedness that means maybe you reciprocate the gift uh, is a human universal. And some anthropologists say there are societies where to refuse a gift is tantamount to a declaration of war. Um, it's, it's not accepting a social relationship uh, and the social obligations that go with it. When you look at, uh, and most of these things have at the bottom of them social stress. Um, and the crucial element in that uh, is the stress that comes from the quality of social relationships. And friendship is, you know, you're getting positive feedback. Your people like your company, they enjoy being with you. Whereas if you don't have friends and you start worrying about maybe people think I'm uh, unattractive, socially gauche, uh, stupid, you know, we all suddenly come, become filled with self-doubts if we feel excluded and not uh, uh, included in things. Uh, in many experiments, psychological experiments, they look to see what happens to our stress hormones when you give people stressful things to do. Um, there have been several hundred experiments of that kind around the world. And in this study, they looked through those experiments to see what kind of stressful tasks used in them were most likely to push up people's stress hormones. You know, is it really doing mathematical problems that makes us stressed? Is it reading the marks out at the end and you, a little bit of embarrassment if you've done badly? Is it being videoed while you do things? Is it writing about an unpleasant experience or having a very loud noise or having your feet in iced water? You know, endless different things were used to induce stress while they measured stress hormones. And in this... Uh, paper, 
they say that what pushes up your stress levels most reliably um, is uh, tasks that include what they called social evaluative threat. They say in the paper, threats to self-esteem or social status where other people can negatively judge your performance. And that's, of course, why things like public speaking are a problem and also why, uh, you know, you worry about if you go up and talk to somebody, whether they'll think you're, uh, you know, all these kinds of self-doubts are there all the time. Uh, and we are particularly sensitive to them. And you see how immediately um, uh, these worries about status and so on um, get into, uh, well, how they are related to status. We now know that in uh, more unequal societies there are higher levels of status anxiety. Along the bottom you have different income groups. So the poorest tenth of the population is here, going all the way through to the richest tenth of the population here. And in more unequal societies, which is the top line, um, Oh, and this um, is very unhelpful, but this, this is the line of the high inequality societies with more status anxiety, and this bottom one, the uh, uh, more equal societies with lower levels of status anxiety. But note that it goes all the way across the society. It's not just the bottom that people worry about these things. Now, with, sorry, with the, those increased worries about status and our sensitivity to status issues, uh, how we're seen and judged, um, of course, in more, I mean, as I've shown you, in more unequal societies, some people are hugely important. And other people we regard as almost worthless. You know, whether Americans talk about white trash and um, uh, there are nasty names and we have prejudiced attitudes that the poor are poor because they're lazy and stupid and things like that. Um, but in society, more unequal societies where we are more worried about how we're seen and judged, we all get uh, very sensitive to, the, to, the, to these issues. And there are two ways you can respond. Either people are overcome with self-doubt lack of confidence, low self-esteem, they become depressed, social contact becomes very uh, stressful, it's an ordeal, so you withdraw from social life. Um, you know, whether it's not going to parties or not answering the phone or some people won't answer the front door or things like that. You know, a whole range of, of uh, those responses to do with lack of confidence. But then the other responses where if you're worried about how you're seen and judged and actually, you know, you think you've done quite well, you start to flaunt it. You start to uh, go in for a kind of narcissism, self-advertisement. So um, you find ways of bringing your achievements into the conversation. Um, I, I, I feel I've sat through many, di many dinner parties where people have told little jokes all around the table and uh, actually all the jokes have a subtext. So this funny thing happened, but it happened when I was going to get my prize at Harvard. Um, or uh, it happened at an airport in Bali where we, when we were just coming back from our family holiday. Um, you know, these kind of things that... Um, uh, the endless... Is, examples of it all the time. Actually, a, a Dutch uh, PhD student of um, uh, Kate, my co-author, and now my wife, uh, says she talks about how in, uh, when she's introduced to people in the Netherlands, um, they just give their name. But in England, uh, there's more recognition that status matters, so they'll say, uh, this is so-and-so who is doing a PhD with Kate. Um, so a need to give them a little bit of a foundation uh, so you know, you know a little bit more about the status of the person you're talking to. So you see the depression going up in more unequal societies. Um, these are American states, more depression in the more unequal ones there. 
Uh, narcissism, this is Jean Twenge's work. She showed that narcissism has risen dramatically in the States. We just added this line showing what's happened to inequality, possible relationship between the two. Um, but this paper is an important one too because it shows that process of what they call self-enhancement or self-advertisement, self-aggrandizement. And uh, basically people in these different societies are asked to rate themselves compared to the national average on a number of criteria. So do you think you're cleverer than other people in Belgium? Do you think you're more attractive? Are you more generous? Um, things like this, and you rate yourself. And what this shows in more unequal societies, people talk themselves up. They say, I'm pretty good, you know. Uh, it's that kind of self-enhancement. It's part of the narcissism. Okay, that's what's happened to inequality in the 20th century in most countries. Uh, Netherlands and Belgium uh, have had much smaller rises or, or have stayed fairly flat compared to the others. Um, this basically is the rise and fall of the labor movement. So that top line is the share of income going to the top 10% in America, that red line. Um, it fell in the 1930s and goes on falling until sometime uh, in the late 1970s and then the modern rise of inequality. But trade union membership, the blue line, did exactly the opposite. It's not because trade unions do wonderful things for their members' wages, I'm sure they help. It's more, I think, that it is an index of the whole sort of countervailing ideology uh, that has given way largely to neoliberal economic thinking. Um, I think we need to solve these problems not only by um, uh, dealing with tax havens um, and tax avoidance and making tax more progressive again, but I think actually as most of the rise in uh, inequality has come in most of those countries from the takeoff of top incomes, uh, and I don't think we're going to, modern industry is less suitable for large and powerful trade union movements. I think we have to think about uh, a wider process of economic democracy. Uh, employee representatives on company boards, um, which I think you don't have much of here, they're very weak provisions, um, but some European countries like Germany, it's much stronger. Uh, but I think we also need incentives to uh, employee buyouts, employee-owned businesses and cooperatives and so on. They have much smaller income differences. Uh, the studies suggest that productivity improves um, and people say that it turns a business into, from being a piece of property into a community. And we've lost community in residential areas very often and yet it's at work that we have most to do, do with each other. And yet so many of the large companies are really systems for concentrating power and wealth undemocratically at the top. So pay differences in many British and American companies, 300 to 1 uh, between the bottom and the top. Um, and I think we must really think of that as the next step in human emancipation, moving towards all forms of encouraging, all forms of greater economic democracy. So I'll stop there. I'm sure I've spent too long. Yes, probably. Thank you.